says, ah, he's not that awesome. All right. <laughs> so one of the questions that we have is, what about this anesthesia? I mean, isn't anesthesia is anesthesia is anesthesia? I've had anesthesia. You've had surgery before, and well, anesthesia. And uh, in fact, there's some brand new research, and it's important for our patients because many of our patients are very heavy, and obesity plus anesthesia can be a deadly combination. Okay, so going to sleep and waking up is always serious. Uh, we're blessed in the United States that nowadays is pretty safe, uh, but there are factors, there are situations that make the anesthesia, the going to sleep and waking up more dangerous. Okay particularly obesity with its effect on the lungs, its effect on the heart. The tissue up around the neck and the face where the breathing tube has to go in mean that anesthesia in heavy people increases the risk of complications of the anesthesia where you don't wake up, you don't breathe well, you have troubles or problems like that. And it might help to understand that most anesthesia in the world today all uses two classes of medications as kind of the primary components for the anesthetic, and that's narcotics plus gas anesthetics. And both of those are spectacular medications. They changed the world when uh, they were put together in the uh, ether dome at uh, Harvard where they began using anesthesia so that people could have uh, uh, surgery done and not be suffering in pain. But they both have terrible, problematic complications associated with them. So let's talk about narcotics. Wonderful drugs. Wonderful, amazing, tremendous drugs. Because you can take someone who is suffering in pain and relieve their pain. That's great. The problem of relieving somebody's pain with narcotics are twofold. Number one, the narcotic can cause nausea and vomiting. So if you've ever had codeine, uh, with nausea and vomiting, you know, it can cause that. In fact, there's a spot in the brain stem where the chemical reacts and it causes the animal to retch. It's just like a switch. You touch that area, you're throwing up. Mm -hmm. So narcotics are wonderful, but a lot of nausea and vomiting if you use more than a low or medium dose. So a lot of pain, need a lot of narcotics, all of a sudden your patient says the pain is better and they're retching like uh, that, that girl in the scary movie, you know. That's unpleasant. Usually it's not deadly though. The narcotics have another side effect which is potentially deadly and that is it turns down the breathing system. You and I right now can talk, go to sleep, watch TV, run a marathon, and we really don't have to think about breathing. We have an automatic center in the brain stem that says, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And if that were damaged, you would die within a few minutes because you wouldn't breathe. Narcotics can, at higher doses, turn off that breathing system. That's how narcotic addicts may sometimes die of an overdose. They just stop breathing. So again, let's go back to our patient that we're talking about today. We say, we want to give you pain relief, and some character has just stabbed you with a spear five times, crushed your stomach with a pair of pliers, cut it with a razor blade, and then stapled it. Ouch. Now we come along with compassion. We want to take away your pain, and we give you narcotics, which can make you nauseated and throw up, and potentially stop or slow down your breathing, Plus, if you're a heavy person, you may have lung problems already, and that combination then puts us all in big, deep water. And occasionally, people die after anesthesia because of a combination of narcotics, obesity, and, and the pains and the limitations of the surgery itself. So narcotics are wonderful, and we want to be compassionate to our patients. We don't want to see them suffer, but we also have to recognize that these medications, which are so kind of miraculous in taking away pain, have serious dangers as well. Okay, so now I'm going to stop talking about narcotics and I'm going to tell you about gas anesthetics. Gas anesthetics like ether, but much more advanced. And ether type gas anesthetics have two problems and they're going to sound real familiar. Guess what they are? Nausea and vomiting, respiratory depression. 
So the gas anesthetics that we give for people to have surgery, 90 plus percent of Americans when they have surgery in the United States are having a gas anesthetic, get the wonderful benefit of the anesthesia and not feeling any pain, which is wonderful if you're having a, a hip replacement or somebody opening your chest to do a heart bypass. I don't want to be awake for that. The gas anesthetics are wonderful for that purpose, but again, post-surgery, because particularly they dissolve in the fatty tissue, they can come back out of the fat into your bloodstream and depress your breathing, which can be deadly, especially in combination with a heavy person who also got narcotics for pain relief. Another problem of the gas anesthetics is one person out of every three who gets the gas anesthetics will have severe post-operative nausea and vomiting, just like we talked about the narcotics. So P-O-N-V, post-operative nausea and vomiting. So those are the standards. Everybody gets them. Almost everybody in the United States. That's their treatment, those two. And so a lot of people have troubles with nausea and vomiting after their general <coughs> surgery. And a moderate number of people have respiratory problems, so they don't breathe quite enough. And we had a lady who was sitting over there two weeks ago, and she was had talked about her experience with her gallbladder surgery. And she said when she was kind of halfway awake, there was a whole crowd of people around her screaming at her to breathe. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> For gosh sake, breathe, breathe, breathe. And then as she woke up, she was in a lot of pain. And what happened probably, a little too much medicine, not breathing quite enough, her oxygen's a little low, they're trying to get her awake so her body would start to breathe on its own. They're stimulating her by yelling. They can slap, do all kinds of things. And as she woke up to try and breathe, she felt a lot of pain because they were afraid to give her narcotics because she wasn't breathing well. Now imagine that was a little bit worse or a lot worse. All of a sudden you have a tragedy. She had surgery with us and it did terrific. What do we do different? What's the difference? Well, number one, we don't use gas. We use another kind of drug called propofol, which is an intravenous anesthetic, which does not cause nausea and vomiting. Plus, it doesn't stick around in your bloodstream, doesn't hide in the fatty tissues, so it doesn't come back after we turn it off. So we use, and you may remember this from your permit, we use TIBA, total intravenous, no breathing gas, but intravenous anesthetic. We like that. That's also moderately common. It wasn't too common when we started it 10 years ago. Now people are also using it like we are. But something else has happened. People said to themselves, hey, the reason narcotics work is they go to a place on the cells in our brain and stimulate something that's natural inside of us. In other words, narcotics go to a place that stimulates a section that says, don't feel pain. And the question arose, can we find other chemicals, other drugs that could also protect our patients from feeling pain without some of the side effects of the narcotics? So that is the area of research called opioid narcotics, sparing, we want to use less, anesthesia and analgesia. So what we want to do is tell you about the research that's shown that we can use opioid sparing drugs, drugs that don't require narcotics, which still make you pain free, but don't depress your breathing and don't cause you to have nausea and vomit. So one of those drugs, you know, I bet, ketamine. Okay. Now ketamine is a drug which is not commonly used in us humans because it has side effects when it's used primarily by itself, you can get kind of hallucinations and kind of funny feelings and things like that. They found though, if you give a little bit of ketamine along with the other anesthesia, that it can decrease the need for narcotics. So it's opioid sparing. So you got some ketamine. So anybody have any kind of wild, funny dreams last night? Yeah. Kind of a little. Yeah, and when I got up this morning, I thought I was ready at the hotel, and he didn't call to get the cab to come here for surgery. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the ketamine, and so you may have like uh, 
we hear people tell stories, you know, they think somebody else is in the room or, you know, they see Donald Duck or all mm -hmm. kinds of funny things. And that's a disadvantage of the ketamine, but the advantage is that not only does it decrease your pain, but it also increases breathing. Remember we talked about how narcotics decreases breathing? Bad. Ketamine increases breathing. Another thing that ketamine does, it's a bronchodilator. If you get asthma, you get vaso or bronchoconstriction, and it's trouble breathing and your oxygen and breathing can be a problem. With ketamine, you actually get bronchodilation, so you breathe better, you breathe more, and it's better for you. Not all by itself. In the old days when ketamine was used, it was used totally by itself, and that's not a good drug by itself. But if you use it in combination with the rest of our anesthesia, it's opioid sparing and it protects you by letting you breathe better, have less nausea, use less narcotics, and we don't use gas. There's another drug that we use. It's called dexmetomidine or Presidex. What's that? You do use it? Oh, cool. All right. It's pretty new for us, and a lot of medical doctors don't know about it yet, but Presidex goes to another part of the brain called the alpha-2 receptor, and that is also opioid sparing. So all of our patients yesterday got Presidex and low-dose ketamine. And that means we've shown we've decreased the need for narcotics by about 90%. That means the danger to you of not breathing or having nausea and vomiting goes down. So that's opioid sparing. Now it turns out yesterday you actually got other opioid sparing drugs. You got melatonin and gabapentin and you know those patches you're wearing? One of them is clonidine. All of these are opioid sparing chemicals. All which are pitched into a cocktail to help protect you from nausea and vomiting and respiratory depression and the potential dangers of not getting enough oxygen. And so our anesthesia very different, and I would say, I think, very much better than the average anesthetic experience that we see in most of our other patients when they've had other surgery. And a lot of other doctors are still not familiar with some of this hot new research, and we're excited about it. And we've tested it in our own patients, and we did before and after, and we've shown that we've decreased the need for narcotics, the need for nausea and vomiting medicine, and we've also just asked people how you felt about the anesthesia and the recovery, and people are generally happier, less nauseated, less vomiting, and less pain with the opioid sparing technique. Pretty cool? Okay. So that was a good